So let's see. Some of the students, I think, are in the Olympic seminar. And so rather than start right in with the lecture, I thought I would try to answer some questions. That some of you may have. So. One question for me. As I mentioned, I don't read the book of grace. So which means I don't have that question either. Does anybody else have any questions? All right. Well, there are a number of topics that I could discuss. One, instead of answering questions, I could review Yang Mill's theory. Say some things about functional integration. Although actually, I was going to put them in this lecture. Maybe I should just start the lecture. I should just do that. Or would you rather review Yang Mill's theory? Yeah, review Yang Mill's theory. All right. Why don't you stop the tape for a second then, because I have to go get my notes on that. It says the panel of this group is huge. Well, it's worth quite a bit of information. It's where all the funding is, right? Exactly. All right. So let's see. All right. I guess this is. All right. So now, so you guys need to tell me, though, should I go faster or slower? OK. So the idea is you have a vector psi of x, which conventionally is written like that as a column vector of fields, depending on the space-time point x. And if we adopt vector and matrix notation, then the idea of a gauge transformation is that we multiply the vector by, in this case, an n by n matrix, g of x. And so that means you have a transformation of the fields. Now, these are a symmetry transformation if the action, which is the integral of the Lagrange density over space-time, and the Lagrange density, of course, involves the fields. And so it's L of psi and I don't know which notation we like, but d mu psi. And of course, the point x, d fourth x, if s is invariant under this transformation, then this is a symmetry. And if g actually depends upon this point x, then it's called a local symmetry. Or equivalently, a gauge symmetry. So gauge symmetry is one in which 
the transformation depends upon the space-time point x, and uh, now if if this is a symmetry for a given g, and it's also a symmetry for another g, uh, then what you could say is, for example. In other words, you would have a product of two matrices, n by n matrices, at the same space time point, and you still, if the action is still invariant, then what you have is you have invariance under a group, a group of transformations. And this group of transformations, since they're n by n matrices, will in general, these matrices in general will not commute with each other, and so it will be a non-abelian group. And so this is a non-abelian gauge theory. So that's basically the, that's the definition of what a non-abelian gauge theory is. And then, in order to have an action invariant, one needs to, um, define what's called a covariant derivative, and the idea is that the covariant derivative under a gauge transformation should just turn into, should behave the same way the field behaves. In other words, the field is psi prime of x is g of x psi of x, and so what one wants is to have the derivatives of the field transform the same way. The ordinary derivatives won't transform the same way, but we can define something that will transform the same way. That's called the covariant derivative. Do ask questions. Um, these notes are all online. I wouldn't try to follow in the book or anything. Um, I mean, if you want to, um, can, can I just ask one quick question? I'm yeah. sorry I was late, but uh, yeah. so what is the, uh, right now, the, uh, the main topic? Is it just generally non abelian uh, theories? Yeah, no, well, non abelian gauge theories is the main topic of the second semester, and it's been the main topic of the last month or so of the first semester. Um, and the reason is that the standard model and all extensions of the standard model except for string theory are non-abelian gauge theories. Um, string theory is something that in the low energy limit gives you a non-abelian gauge theory. So it's in that sense that it's important to do this. Um, So what we want is we want this to be the case, and um, so what that means basically is we know what the what how psi transforms under gauge transformation. So this is saying the d prime mu of x psi prime of x should be this. But that's d prime mu of x, d of x, psi of x. So the equation that we have then is g d mu psi of x should be d prime g psi of x. Or in other words, g of x d mu of x is d prime mu of x d of x. And that gives us a recipe for how d transforms, namely d prime of x should be g inverse of x. Uh, no, I'm sorry, g of x, d mu of x, g inverse of x. So this is the way in which a covariant derivative transforms. And um, it turns out that it's possible to have such a transformation if we just turn the ordinary derivative 
here I'm using the notation d mu is partial partial x mu. So d mu plus something will call a mu of x. This is in fact what's done in electrodynamics, but here we'll see that a is a matrix. Am I going too slowly for some of you? Or is it good to repeat this? It's probably good to repeat it. Okay. Um, so, what will this look like then? Well, it'll, if we just look at this equation, it will be g of x, d mu plus a mu of x, g inverse of x, should be d prime, and d prime is d mu plus a mu prime of x. Maybe I should try to call Tom to tell him that that thing is kind of all right. That's so we can get a better camera. Okay, so that's, um, that's the equation. And we can see that this derivative here can act on G inverse, or it can stay a live derivative, in which case it cancels this because it's multiplied by G G inverse. In other words, suppressing the X. Hello? We have G G inverse D mu plus G D mu G inverse plus G A mu G inverse equals D mu plus A mu prime. Okay. And uh, so this, rewriting this since G G inverse is one, this is D mu hello plus G D mu G inverse plus G A mu G inverse equals D mu plus A mu prime. So this tells us that A mu prime is G A mu G inverse plus G D mu G inverse. So this tells us how this A mu prime has to transform. I don't know what's going on here. I dialed this number in. Any questions? Tom, uh, they just broke. So maybe you can get the camera. That'd be great. Thanks. All right. So, so let's see. Um, I think I think I. So this is the general structure of a non-abelian gauge theory. For an abelian gauge theory, the simplest example is keep the eye data of X. And this is how quantum electrodynamics or ordinary electrodynamics works. Then uh, A mu prime of X is just by this would be E the I theta, A mu E the minus I theta plus E the I theta D mu E the minus I theta. And so altogether, these space factors just cancel and you get A mu of uh, minus I D mu of theta of X. So this is how the gauge field, the electromagnetic field transforms. And that's just classic electrodynamics. In the case of um, SU2 gauge theory, then G of X is E to the I theta of X dotted into sigma over two that's the conventional way of doing it. And um, these notes are online. I don't think I should go through the whole shtick here. Um, let me just say what an infinitesimal transformation is. It turns out to be, this is if 
if theta is very small, that is to say, if we say theta is equal to an infinitesimal vector epsilon, then this is, then it turns out that you need three A's, one for each of the generators, sigma. And this is this minus epsilon ABC, epsilon BAC mu minus I DU epsilon A. This epsilon ABC comes about because of the structure constant. Sigma A over 2, sigma B over 2 is I epsilon ABC sigma C over 2, summing over C. And epsilon ABC is the totally anti-symmetric three tenths or so. Epsilon 1, 2, 3 is 1, but it's totally anti-symmetric. So epsilon 2, 1, 2 minus 1, epsilon 1, 1, 2, 0, and so forth. All right, so I think maybe that's enough of a review. What do you think? All right, let me just say something about what these. I just have one question. Yes. So these generators of the whatever symmetry group, to each of those there will be a conserved current, right? Excuse me? Corresponding to each of these generators of the gauge group, there will be a conserved current. Interesting question. Yeah, I think that one can say that, yeah. Right. And what's interesting is there's the conserved current and there's the gauge invariant current. And I'm not sure that they're actually the same. So let me think about that. Why don't we talk after class and we can focus in on that. Let me just add in, just say what the action then is. In electrodynamics, this Lagrange density is minus a quarter F mu nu, F mu nu. Well, it's that and then it's also plus psi bar, what's called I d slash minus M psi. This d slash is Feynman's notation, gamma mu, d mu. The gamma matrices, you remember, are matrices such as gamma mu, gamma nu. Anti-commutator is 2 g mu nu or equivalently 2 eta mu nu, where in flat space time, this eta mu nu is 2. It's either minus 1, 1, 1, 1 is in Weinberg, or you multiply everything by minus 1, you get the Peskin-Schroeder convention. In an Arnabelian case, S is an integral minus a quarter F a mu nu, F mu nu a plus psi bar I d slash minus M psi d fourth x. And now F a mu nu is d mu a a mu minus d mu a a mu plus g F a b c a b a c mu nu. These are the structure constants of which epsilon a b c is a particular example for SU2. This d mu is actually a matrix, and it's d mu delta alpha beta minus I g 
AA, mu, TA, alpha, beta, where the Ts are the generators, so you have TA, TB, I, FABC, TC. Whoops, I somehow have upper indices. For compact non-indicated groups, there's no point in raising and lowering the group indices. So, let's see. The let me back up now and switch to a brief review of the path intervals. The basic idea of the path interval is to compute matrix elements of either the time evolution operator or the statistical density matrix, if you want, E to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian. And these are basically obtained by just taking the matrix elements and then chopping these exponentials into products of many tiny slices. And so you have E to the minus I, DTH, and then you put in a complete set of states here and here, like that and like that, and then you have another one, E to the minus I, DTH, and so forth. And you just form this product. And this is described in this online, on my online notes here from this math book that I'm writing, which is bio.phys.un.edu. Now, you can find it under 524. It's a little easier to find if you look under 466, which is the course that I sort of wrote it for, 466, 467. So you can go to either place, but it's easier to find if you go there. Now, these path integrals are based on Gaussian integrals, and the Gaussian integrals are E to the minus I, A, X minus C over 2A squared, DX, and this is the square root of pi over pi A. Another version of this is E to the minus R, X minus C over 2R squared, DX, 